Amen. Thank you, Lord, for another beautiful Sunday. Uh, I believe it's June 11th. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this week. But I'm especially geeked up and fired up because I got my little evangelist here, Talia Hannah, with me. Oh, I love her. Okay, before I start, uh, she says she has something that she wanted to say. What do you want to say? Hi. Who are you saying hello to? Mama, I love you. And what you want Mama to do? Come to who? Jesus. All right, because Jesus what? Hmm. Jesus what? What is Jesus? He, he what? Blesses. And he starts with an L. A? No. He... Jesus starts with loves. an L. Jesus say, Mama, Jesus loves you. Mama, Jesus loves you. All right, let's do a little prayer, okay? Okay. You do a little one-line, two-line prayer, then she's going to exit stage right, and I'm going to finish up the prayer. Go ahead. You go ahead and pray. You got to speak louder now, okay? Speak up. Go ahead. Speak. Close your eyes. Speak up. In the name of Jesus, I um, pray for you to help the whole world get to you. And who else you want to pray for? I want to pray for my mom. You pray for your mama? What about the little ones in the world? Stop um, moving. And I pray for the little ones that are sick and, um, and, and the elder ones. And the elderly, that's right. And now who else you want to pray for? Anybody else you want to pray for? No. Okay, when you go to school, who do you want to pray for? All the kids and the staff. All right, you pray for it starts with a T. Teachers. And you pray for all the teachers. And you ask that Jesus put what over us? His grace. His grace. And what else? Mercy. And his heart. No, it starts with an L. And his Jesus love. And his love. Amen. Say amen. 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 Okay, let Papa go do his thing now, okay? All right. All righty. Well, good to be back again. I'm all fired up and geeked up. Finally got, ah, oh, thank you, Lord. The Lord loves you. I tell you, when I say he loves you, he loves you. Um, I watched that little one uh, do a John the Baptist in the womb and leap. I watched her roll and tumble. She did gymnastics in the in, 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 in her mama's womb. I'd be on the left side, call her from the right side. She'd flip over. I, I'd seen so much from her. She said her first one or two line prayers. And she was just a little over, I think, 20 year and two months, maybe a year, another year and a half. She came and ran up to me and said two lines. And I've been sharing with her all throughout. You know, so um, the Lord can do amazing things with small packages and that, that's that's a beautiful thing to know he doesn't need much he doesn't need much in height all he needs is the depth of a person's heart that surrenders to him it's all jesus needs is a heart that surrenders to him and is all in not only to be saved by him to be set apart by him so that he can train you and teach you but to serve him so thank you oh lord for that thank you for this moment i'd like to thank dr thomas blackwell for once again uh, allowing me to come up on these grounds after i pressed a little buzzer on the ice <laughs> i gotta say <see. laughs> but i'd like to thank him i love him with all my heart um I'd like to thank God the Father for pegging this moment here. And God the Son, Jesus Christ, my personal Lord and Savior, and uh, Israel's Messiah and the Savior of the world uh, for paving that new way, completing that promise uh, that was penned in the Old Testament and uh, sprung forth in the new. I'd like to thank Jesus for doing what he and he alone uh, did for all mankind and uh, giving us a new opportunity to be have peace with God, learn of his peace, and reside in eternal peace. 
with Yehovah Shalom, the God of peace. And last but not least, I always got to smile when I do this. And copy done! God, the Holy Spirit, would like to give him a shout out and a thanks uh, for being my teacher, my trainer, one who corrects, instructs, and of course convicts an individual uh, to become more like Jesus is the goal in mind and in heart and in our walk. So I'd like to thank him who is the captain of the second ark of grace, the body of Christ that he commands, he leads, guides, and directs on the waters of life, twisting and turning up and down, no matter how stormy, how dark, uh, it could be at wit's end. He continues to lead it forward to the seashores of glory to be with the Lord of glory in eternal glory. Thank you to all three. Thank you to Dr. Thomas. Thank you to my mother. And of course, Lil Talia Hannah, I love you both. Uh, thank you to the rest of my family. I'd like to thank those who have come into my life by God's doing, uh, acquaintances, associates, uh, enemies, frenemies, sometimes on callers. Uh, I'd like to thank all who have been in Christ and those who have not been in Christ that have been in my life and have paid, played some role in me being molded up to this point to share one, us again, a story. I'm here to share a continuous story, uh, one Sunday after another, and it is centered on Jesus Christ and his death for all our sins up on the cross almost 2,000 years ago, and he was buried bodily, and he rose on the third day bodily, but our case of sins did not rise again. It has been done with, washed away, and all we need to do is surrender and allocute us in the court system. And just, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm here presenting myself. I'm lost. I need the way out. I need you and you alone. Because your word says you are the savior. And I'm here to surrender and ask you to save my soul. I believe that you died on the cross. By faith, I believe it. And I believe you was buried and you rose on the third day for me, and I surrender. Lord Jesus, save me. This is what I am here for, uh, being used by the Holy Spirit to share, thanking those that are in Christ fellowshipping with us right now, but much more importantly, Father, in the name of Jesus, please bring someone aboard or some aboard today and throughout the week that are not in Christ, that need to hear the word, your word of salvation through Jesus Christ. Because salvation is found through none other, as Peter preached in Acts 2, but through Jesus Christ. And him crucified, buried, and resurrected. I believe it was Acts 2, Acts 3. But uh, nonetheless, salvation is found through no one but by faith of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus over this message. We pray thanking you for this week, this life, this opportunity. Pray that some have been drawn here to you. As Jesus said, if he be lifted up, all shall be drawn unto him. We pray that some have been drawn right now and furthermore through the week as you use us in Christ to share it and spread it, plant it and water it, and you lift it up, you give it the increase. Uh, some may be saved before uh, the following week with your grace over all of us to bring us back here again. We pray, Father, this prayer in Jesus' name and say, Amen. Amen. Um, last week, we uh, continued on the theme of surrender. And just a brief touch up, we started it on April 16th, uh, part one of the theme called Surrender. And we noted that there is a spiritual pollution since Adam, which was in this case, uh, part one, where we were in Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 13. 
um, that led the people to be in captivity. Sin will lead, will, will, will bring, will put you in a position of captivity. But thanks be to God that if we, as he instructed uh, his people when they were in captive, if they were to turn to him, call call to him, call out to him, and, and come to him and ask him to come to them, uh, and if they did this uh, with a heart that seeked uh, freedom from their captivity uh, as the most prevalent, situ prevalent need, with a heart that surrenders, God would be faithful with his promise. And he would always love them but uh, because they're, they're special to him. But he promised to love them, to bless them, you know, to heal and deliver them victoriously. And we learned that that also applies to us today. If we call out to the name above all names, Jesus Christ, that God will shower us with his love. He will bless that individual with his salvation when they surrender uh, by faith that he died on the cross, was buried, and on the third day rose bodily, and that he will heal them, okay? And he will provide his wisdom through the Holy Spirit for them to be able to live like Jesus Christ, and that he will bring them victory upon their life. Um, but we learned that in part two, uh, we took a turn at the Lord Acts, why won't we surrender? And we learned that on the 23rd of April and the 30th of April, two points stood out. On the 23rd, dealing with the same scripture, Romans 1.18, that mankind will not surrender to God because they just simply want to do away, put away, and, 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 and put down by suppressing the truth, suppressing God's word and will. We don't want to deal with it, don't want to put up with it. And we tell God regarding your truth, that will free me from my captivity and sin, the spiritual pollution called sin, heading to hell. I, I, I kind of like this journey right now. I'm, 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 I got some things to accomplish, some things to do. I, I'm busy. I'm tied up. Uh, I need to put this thing, put this thing away. And on the 30th, we took it a step further. Not only do we want to plead the fifth as a sinner before God, we want to seek a continuance. I'll deal with you later. I got some things to do, but we want to suppress. The evidence. I want to put away, I want to do away with me being a sinner, God, before you, okay? I want this case thrown out, and I'll see you in heaven as a sinner. Uh, that's what we learned. And then on the 7th of May, we part, uh, that'd be part four, in the story of Jonah, chapter one, verse, first three verses, we learned that there's a selfishness factor about us. That prevents us from surrendering to Jesus Christ. On the 14th, we learned uh, that influences. And we were in Deuteronomy 7, the first seven verses, with the umbrella of judges. We didn't quite get into it that week. But in the first seven verses, what stood out was that God informed them, do not intermarry. Okay? You're not to be influenced by pagan nations, the unsaved. You're not to be influenced by the unsaved okay and in verses 11 through 15 he informed them that if they were to listen to him uh, and, and keep his commandments in their heart okay uh, obey it follow it live it out okay he would do the rest okay they would live a blessed victorious life with and in him. Okay? He be their God, they be he be their people, we be his they would be his people, his children, he be their God and their father. Uh, on the 21st, we continued with the theme of influences and judges, and what stood out there was that in those days there were no kings. I believe that was Judges 2, and the people did what was right in their own eyes. And the theme over and over again was that you see that the people continuously did evil in the sight of the Lord. They knew who they were sinning against, first and foremost, before they went ahead and committed these sins. Okay, But over and over and over again, they fell into a deep, deep, deep abyss of a problem because of their sins. But God, who is faithful to his covenant, thank you, Lord, who does not change, 
would, yeah, they'd have to reap the consequences, but he would help them along the way to get back on track. Okay, but Judges is continuous up and down with the people, up with God and down away from God. Okay, and then on the 28th, uh, we went into the theme of stubbornness, and that also continued yes, uh, last, last, excuse me, on the 4th last Sunday, and we'll be continuing it on today, stubbornness. And it's centered on Exodus 5 through 11, chapter 5 through 11. Uh, no specific verses, but... These are the chapters that we're covering, and it's centered around, perhaps, I would say, the most stubborn of all individuals, other than the nation of Israel itself in the Bible, Pharaoh of Egypt, okay? And um, last week, we picked up that, um, uh, along the theme of stubbornness, the three points that we carried along. That stubbornness carries... Uh, Point one, a refusal to compromise, an uh, unwillingness to change, and a determination to prove one's point. And uh, Pharaoh <laughs> pretty much lived this out pretty good. He was a master. He had his master's. He has his PhD, his doctrine, whatever the highest degree is. He had that and then some when it came to these three points regarding stu his stubbornness. Um, but... The Lord showed me something regarding stubbornness that I'd like to highlight. Excuse me. Stubbornness, our stubbornness as an individual ha has an effect on other people's lives. Okay? The stubbornness of Israel especially noted it in the Pharisees, to want to surrender and acknowledge their Messiah, Jesus, cost not only them, but it cost the nation dearly. Okay? It cost the nation of Israel dearly. Uh, the stubbornness of the from the high priest down. Okay? Uh, it cost the nation dearly, okay? And we're going to see in Pharaoh, he's not part of the Hebrew nation, the chosen, hand-chosen nation that God himself developed. But we're going to parallel what's going on with Pharaoh to up here in today's times to show anyone listening right now or anyone who receives this message uh, how stubbornness not only can hurt you, okay, you're going to reap some really bad consequences for your actions of stubbornness, but you can detrimentally to the uttermost and guttermost cause others demise. And what I mean by demise, your stubbornness to surrender to Jesus Christ, and then when you surrender to him, we talked about it last week, uh, how people get saved, they surrender to be saved, but then they're stubborn to be used by, the, to be trained and taught by the Holy Spirit to eventually serve. They get saved when they, they surrender to get saved, but then they sit in stubbornness and they never ever are used to serve because they, that's not what their motive was about. Whatever your motive was when you surrendered to Jesus, it has to be but one. I surrender to you, Lord Jesus, by faith that you died on the cross for my sins. You was buried. And on the third day, you rose bodily. But my case of sins did not rise. I surrender and I ask that you save me from my sins and lead me to eternal life. And when you did that, you did that because you recognized that your life of sin in this uh, abyss of darkness, this, this cemetery that is called earth, this ju dying, decaying, judged world, you were heading to hell. The life that you were leading, you recognized your soul was in peril. 
and you became convicted about it, broken about it, remorseful to the depths of your heart and your soul. And you said, it's time for me to get right with my maker. I don't want to be judged at the end. I want to be welcomed. And you surrendered. And when you surrendered, you did not want to sit in stubbornness, but you wanted to be set aside, sanctified, so that you can be prepared to serve Jesus, to walk and live like Jesus so that others can come to Jesus by the Holy Spirit working in and through you. That's why that was your motive for surrendering to Jesus. That you wanted to be used by Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, to bring others to Jesus. You did not want to sit in stubbornness because you recognize that that's not why you surrendered. You recognize that you needed this blessing, and now that others in your family, in your neighborhood, in your community, at your job, at your school, wherever, need the same blessing. Thank you, Lord. That's Christianity. Okay? But in Pharaoh, we have someone that we saw in Exodus 5, 9, okay, after Moses presented the request by God to let his people go. It weren't Pharaoh's people, okay? But Pharaoh had this entitlement, like, they were his. They were here to serve him, okay, and serve this nation and serve the people of Egypt, okay? That's what Hebrews were for, okay? Slavery, okay? Um, but... God made a request, okay? He said, let his people go, okay? And not only did Pharaoh, well, he did answer. Honestly, he said, I don't know your God. True answer. He didn't know him. Because had he known him, okay, he'd be with him, okay? Matter of fact, he'd have renounced his title and left Egypt with the Hebrews. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit, okay? So, but not only that, but he was one that served the false gods. And a lot of these pharaohs considered themselves as a lot of uh, uh, notoriously uh, bad leaders throughout the man, man's history uh, would consider themselves some a uh, god themselves, okay? So, to consider yourself god status, okay, and submit to what they call a true and living god, uh, that just deletes your godship, okay? And that's not going to happen. So he not only told Moses, no way, okay? This ain't happening. This request is not happening. Don't know him, don't want to know him, don't care about him. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you what my response is going to be. I'm going to unleash a little hell on your, on your, on your brothers and sisters. And the first point of stubbornness if you are a stubborn individual okay you can cause various degrees but in this case we're looking at an intense degree of suffering upon others okay Pharaoh's stubbornness caused the Hebrews because of his decree to have to be forced to labor longer days, as the dead days were already long enough, okay? It wasn't no eight hours with 15-minute breaks and hour breaks, vacation time, sick leave, paid leave, they, or, you know, uh, a personal leave and discipline. It wasn't none of that, okay? You come in, hard labor, okay? From the beginning to the end of the day. Give you just a little bit enough time. To lay down and rest. Okay? That was basically it. But he extended the day a whole heck of a lot longer. Okay? And made it much more physically intense and difficult. Okay? He made their days longer in time and physically, mentally harder in the body, okay? And along the way, if that wasn't enough, he 
pushed them through his workers, through his through his servants that were there, the Egyptians, by yelling and screaming and degrading them and demeaning them and beating them. Okay? And in some cases to the point of death. Okay? Because when slavery in any parts of this world through through the history of man, uh many died. Okay? The weak ones that couldn't keep up, you know what? They did away with them. And even some who were of strength, okay, of intelligence, okay, they had to go. Everyone went through this. This was an, this was an a, a, a equal across the board, young and old, male and female. You had to work harder, longer, more intense, more physical. You were demeaned, degraded, beaten, tortured, imprisoned along the way. And you had no rights. You had no voice and no rights. Okay? And that's what Pharaoh's response was to Moses coming before him, speaking about a true and living God and his request to let all the Hebrews go. Okay? To be with him. Okay? So, stubbornness which again we identified as a refusal to compromise. You see that right now. He ain't willing to change what's going on. And he is determined to prove his point. Well, this resulted in intense, in increased intense suffering upon the Hebrews. Okay? To the point. That they let Moses know how they felt. Moses went back to the Lord and said, hey, man, something up with this plan, man. Folks ain't happy. They, 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 they working harder, longer. They, they, they going through holy. They going through hell over there. Beaten with no rights. People dying. They starving. They begging and pleading for, for a way out of this. Okay? It ain't even living. It's just surviving. Okay? Um, so the first point is stubbornness can cause upon others intense suffering. And then we looked at Exodus chapter 7, uh, which was the first uh, plague, the first, uh, what I would say, chapter of judgment from the true and living God upon Egypt. Upon Pharaoh and the nation of Egypt, okay? Um, when he used uh, Moses and Aaron, okay, to turn the waters of Egypt to blood. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know how you would feel if you have your Fiji water, your, uh, your arrowhead, your sparklet, your... Uh, Whatever brand you use, okay, all the way to these top of the line bottles, Ule Fule bottles, and all of a sudden you go to take a drink from it, and you stop because you notice there's a color, and then when you look at it, it's it's, it's just blood. Uh, how would you react if everything in your refrigerator was blood as a liquid, came out the faucet in the kitchen, the bathroom, the shower, even the toilet, blood? You run outside, you turn your spigot on trying to be a smart a smart butt, and blood coming out of that. You turn the fire hydrant on, blood coming out of that. You go to the supermarket, the local market, the liquor mart, any mart, everything they tell you, something, something, something going on here, everything red, and, and you know it's blood, okay? So much blood was upon Egypt. In these seven days, that I tell you, vampires would have had them a seven day lu a seven day luau, a seven day what do you call those uh revival? Because there was so much freaking blood in Egypt that nobody they'd all been fat vampires. Okay, so much blood that you know what? Every hospital that would have been in Egypt in them days. I'm just using an analogy. How we have hospitals today. And the, the liquor bank, the blood banks would have been full. There'd be no need to come in and get blood. 
Because they're not black for, 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 for perhaps a decade. Okay? They're going to have to build a bigger barn. Okay? Bigger storage houses to store up all the blood that they had in case of transfusions or other emergencies and the blood was needed. Okay? For seven days, Egypt was a nation that for intense purposes was a bloody nation. Perhaps God was trying to give them a, a symbolism of, you know what, you keep this up, oh Pharaoh, it's going to cost some blood in this nation. The blood you see right now that's been, that's been turned, uh, how I've turned water to blood, I'm, I'm giving you a message that you keep this up. It, it, it's gonna be that. It's gonna be some blood uh, upon this nation, one person to the next. It's gonna cost. Okay. Now we know Jesus turned water to wine, and it was for a glorious purpose. Okay. Jesus's motive was to reveal his glory, introduce himself. Okay. Upon the nation, upon the people that were there. Okay? Pharaoh, because of his stubbornness, brought, you know, this water water to blood. This is a curse. Okay? This was not a good thing. Mankind is made up of mainly water, and we need water on a daily basis. Imagine the elderly and the sick. And, and, and the youth that were in need of water and for seven days and not, man, there had to have been plenty of people that died in them seven days, okay? And plenty of people that got so sick they never recovered after everything was reversed back to water. So stubbornness, we see in point one, can cause intense suffering upon others, but it can also cause seasons of harsh change and contamination okay we know that the waters were contaminated me being a stubborn person and not surrendering to jesus or me supposedly surrendering to jesus but sitting in stubbornness not willing to come to jesus wholeheartedly surrendering that through the holy spirit i be taught and trained to serve jesus so that others close to me and straight all the way to strangers and the highways and byways can come to Jesus. No, by me saying no to that because I'm sitting in this state of stubbornness, okay? It's going to cause seasons of harsh change. It's going to bring upon storms, valley lows, rough and tough times upon others, starting with those near and dear to me as family and friends, acquaintances, co-workers, all the way to the stranger of strangers in the outwardness of our life that the Holy Spirit would have led us to or led them to us to come to Jesus. Uh, we're going to further contaminate people by aiding and abetting and allowing them to fester as a sinner, okay, and not be one that is saved and called a saint in Christ Jesus. Because I am stubborn. I am not willing to compromise and do it God's way. I don't want to change my point of view and my approach. And in some cases, as one that calls themselves a Christian, okay, and I am determined by any means and all means necessary to prove my point being correct. I have entered into the midst of other people who the Holy Spirit could have used me to bless. I have allowed the gates of their lives to be further opened to bring in harsh seasons of harsh change and further contamination in their state as a sinner. Something to think about. 
you can either be used by God to be a blessing to people, or you can cause major and intense suffering and bring seasons of change upon people's lives where it's bad now and it just gets worse, okay? And their state of contamination as a sinner can just double or quadruple in these seasons because we looked at God like a Pharaoh and said, I am not willing to come to this table and compromise. I am not willing to change and I am willing to sit here and tell you my point, my way is the way, it is the right way. So uh, you check me out, okay? And watch how I do things. Well, guess what? Those are the first two points that we looked at. Point three, okay? Um, in the, I believe it was the next plague, which we see in uh, Exodus 8, we see a plague of frogs. A God informed working through Moses upon Pharaoh would come upon a nation if he refused to let his people go. Okay, and what this point teaches us here, there was frogs everywhere. I don't know about you, but man, if I had one frog in my house, ribbit, 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 day and night, ribbit, ribbit, steps, footprints, sliminess, this and that. If I had just one frog in my house, that would be enough. But I mean, God was talking about frogs everywhere. You could be in your kitchen, you could be in your bathroom, you can be in your kickback room. Hell, if you had a man cave, it'd be a frog cave, okay? Your couches, your seats, everywhere, even in your place, okay? Going and coming, froggy, 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 okay? Now, if, if, if that all of a sudden happened in my life, and I know that Biden... It's being stubborn with God. This 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 God that because you know word had that gotten around all over the nation. Okay? I'm talking about down to the lowest of the lowest. There had to have been some gossip from the palace all the way down to the smallest street, okay? To the poorest of the poor, what Pharaoh is going through with Moses and this so-called true and living God that Moses is proclaiming. Okay? And now, that had that gotten around, okay? Especially now at this stage, knowing that they had already dealt with seven days of no H2O. No matter what the magicians tried, no matter what was prayed, no matter who, who you turned to, heck, you could have turned to the local sorcerer, witchcraft, uh, well, uh, uh, witch, it didn't matter who you turn to, it could not be undone. And we talked about this last week, that anything that God has done, okay, we looked at these plays, no man could undo. When God saves you, there's nothing that no man all the way through Satan can do uh, to can, can, can perform to undo that salvation. Thank you, oh Lord. When God does it, Satan cannot undo it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Okay? So we're at the next point. We got a Kermit the Frog here <laughs> and a Kermit the Frog there. I, I mean, Miss Piggy, if you'd have thrown her in there, she wouldn't even figure out. She could have been upset because she couldn't figure out who was Kermit. There'd be so many Kermies out there, she couldn't figure out who was her Kermie, okay? She would probably be the most upset one in Egypt right now. <laughs> uh, I love the Muppet Show, but nonetheless, that's what went down, okay? And once again, no one was able to undo the situation, okay? And what it teaches us is this. We being stubborn, Sitting in stubbornness, reveling in stubbornness, okay? Unwilling to get out of our stubbornness. Not only do we cause intense suffering, as we've seen in Exodus 5, 
seasons of detrimental, harsh change and contamination in Exodus 7. But at Exodus 8, we can bring upon a season in a person's life where they become overwhelmed by something that could have been prevented and avoided had we not been stubborn. Had we, had we been gone, have we uh, been willing to go from stubbornness to serving by surrendering to Jesus Christ? That person's life might not be overwhelmed with the challenges that they have right now. It's already bad enough. They need Jesus. Okay? But we have further added to their life mountainous weights upon them that have them buried, okay, in a situation or situations in this season of their life that might continue into the next season and the next one after that. And in some cases, let me tell you something, any one of these three points right here, that individual can die that way, okay? Something to think about. I seen some stubborn folks in my family that caused their family walk as atheists when the individual grew up knowing about the true and living God, about the Holy Spirit, about Jesus Christ. Okay? But let that family, that flock go as atheists. Okay? And uh, I know some others in my family. Now, I'm being personal. Okay? You know, uh, that cause their, uh, uh, what do you call it, their flock, okay, to be divided, separated permanently, and, and, and go through a tunnel of darkness in life where to this day, the kids are scarred permanently in every way, Okay. I can just name just two here. There are more. Okay. I had a level of stubbornness in my life. Okay. That caused me uh, dearly. Okay. And even after I got saved, there was some stubbornness about me. And you know what? Sometimes as a Christian, when you get saved and, and you have a stubbornness about you, uh, that's just Christian immaturity. You know, that's just an individual that's not allowing the Holy Spirit to teach and train them and raise them up in that Christian education. So in mind and in heart and in their walk, they do it Jesus way instead of sitting there trying to do and prove points about their way. OK, we all go through that. OK, well, we all hit that point. Somewhere along the way, but you know what? Thanks be to the Holy Spirit who helps us to overcome this stubbornness, okay, to serve. But going back to, I'm going to get to one more point before we close out, okay? Point number four about the stubbornness of Pharaoh, and we're paralleling it to stubbornness of us today. Okay, look at the mirror of your life right now, whether you saved or unsaved. If, if you see some areas in your life you've refused to compromise, areas in your life that you know need to change for the better, and you know what the better is. Well, let's go back to the first point. Your refusal to compromise, you know what you need to let go and you know what you need to allow to come in, okay? Your point two, you're unwilling to change, and you know what the change needs to take place in that area of your life, okay? It could be your whole life at, at, at that, okay? And then point three, uh, your stubbornness has revealed that you are willing to prove a point. You want to prove that you are right about this situation or that situation in your life. 
So if you have any one of those three, a combination of all of the above, you have a level of stubbornness in your life. Okay? And these first three points that we covered, if you look at this stubbornness in your life, I guarantee you, you could connect that to someone or some others in your life that because of your stubbornness, they're suffering. And in most cases, and in a lot of cases, could be, the suffering could be, they're still in darkness as a sinner heading to hell. And you might be one calling yourself a Christian. Okay? Or you might be one that knows to cross over to Christianity. But again, the stubbornness. And there are a lot of people, the majority of the world right now, okay, are stubborn. They refuse to compromise their life for God's. Their way for God's way. Their false gods for the true and living God. Okay? Their life of having it all and having it their way for having Jesus Christ as their Savior to have it all on the other end. And not lose it all, being their soul. Okay? So think about that. Okay? Now, and again, we're still in Exodus 8. Okay? A few points down. Okay? The servants. We don't know how many or the, the level or, or it could have been more than just his closest servants. It could have been a pile load of folks that at that point came and told Pharaoh just after the water being turned to blood around the nation and all the Kermit, all the Kermies around, Kermit the frogs around the nation, okay, told Pharaoh, this is the finger of God, capital G, not their false gods. Okay, when he turned the waters to blood, they had water gods. They had a god that was uh, uh, the image of a frog. Okay, and I believe the rest was a human body. They had, he, God, the true and living God, had already attacked a bunch of their false gods, and it was proven that those false gods had no power to undo that which the true and living God commanded. To be done. That when God, the true and living God said, let there be all the waters of Egypt turn to blood. And let there be a bunch of Kermit the frogs all over the nation. Okay. None of their false gods, whom I'm pretty sure they prayed in a state of panic. Okay. Unto. Could undo. And early, we're only at the second, at the second uh, point of a, the second plague, the second point of judgment that God has thrown out at, at Pharaoh. They told Pharaoh, this is the finger of the true and living God. The same God that Moses is coming and telling you is saying, let his people go. Man, it's that God that's warring against us. Okay. And, 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 and peep this out. God had not even cast war against him yet. He didn't cast no war against him. There wasn't no legions from heaven. There wasn't no legions coming up against him down on earth. It was just a simple, straight sentence. Let my people go. That was it. Okay? That's all he said. He just spoke one sentence. And after each time Moses came in and spoke that sentence... Had all kind of a catastrophe occurred upon the nation. Okay? A catastrophic judgment came down upon the nation. Water the blood and then all the Kermit the frogs. Okay? And they say, yo, this be God himself. Okay? So for them to say that this was God. Dumb folks at that moment were looking at their king. And saying, you know what? All these other gods that we have bowed down and worshipped and, and, and given praise and given our, our sacrifice and our life to, the hell with them. That's God. And we are in a, a, a opposition.
position with God. The Bible never says, <laughs> I would love to have been there as a news reporter to have seen what Pharaoh might have said to these folks, or, or perhaps how many of them might have died, okay? Because what you're basically telling is the king at that point is, uh, yo, G, the way you going about it is screwing us, okay? It's costing us, okay? And it ain't going to get no better because the person that you beefing with, you can't beat, okay? That's God. You can't beat him, Okay? But I'm going to stop right here because the fourth point about our state of stubbornness, we've seen an intense suffering upon others, harsh changes, uh, seasons of harsh change and contamination upon others' lives, them being overwhelmed in their lives. But then this point, you can cause others to stand against God. Keeping forward with this stubbornness, you can influence and infiltrate a person's mind and heart to stand with you against God. Okay? And I'm here to say that to anybody that's there right now, this is your time to renounce your stubbornness and replace it with humility. Humble yourself before Jesus Christ and surrender your heart, your life, that he died on that cross for you, he was buried, and he rose bodily. And when he rose, he rose to give you a hope. Nothing here right now matters. What matters is after this life, a beautiful one with him. If you confess that, if you surrender to that, count yourself as my brother or my sister. I'm Pastor Joseph of the Lighthouse Ministries in Los Angeles. I love you. God loves you, okay? And I pray over your soul that right now it rests in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Someone is resting in your salvation, in your love.